Our keynote speaker is Neil Miller. He is the Director of Informatics for the Center for um, Pediatric Genomic Medicine at Children's Mercy. That is quite an impressive title. Uh, I, let's welcome him to the stage. He's going to talk about analyzing the genome for better patient care. Thank you. Am I, am I on? Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me to, to speak. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so if you indulge me for just a second, we can imagine about how a software engineer ends up becoming the director of informatics for the Center for Pediatric Genomic Medicine. And if I'm completely honest, uh, I'm not sure I understand it myself. Um, so what I think happened was somewhere in the mid, late 90s, uh, I happened to know Pearl really well. That was really my, <laughs> my, my biggest qualification. And uh, as it happens, you know, anybody who knows bioinformatics knows that Perl is really the language of bioinformatics, or it's slowly being eclipsed by Python probably at this point. But um, So that scant skill got me hired at a biotech in something like 1998. And so um, I've ever since been uh, mired in genomes. And um, somehow that led me to a children's hospital in Kansas City. Um, so I've noticed uh, at your talk at this conference, there's a lot of really great technical talks. Um, I thought what I would do is focus a little bit more on um, what I think is a really great application of all these techniques, um, because really we couldn't be doing genomics without software, without big data, um, and without all these intelligent algorithms. And so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our center and what we're doing, and um, yeah, so let's get into it. So our center was established in uh, 2011. The goal was really to take um, things that we've been doing in a research setting and bring it to the front lines of a, of a hospital practice. Um, we started with, let me think, it was three people. Now we're up to around 30. I've got a small but mighty team of informaticians. Uh, they're sort of on the spectrum between software engineer and computational biologist and then uh, one high performance computing engineer who does all my systems administration. Um, our focus has been on doing um, both clinical and research genome sequencing, and the primary goal is to do diagnosis of genetic disease as well as um, precision medicine, which is you know, one of the huge buzzwords right up there with big data at this point. Um, precision medicine meaning uh, managing care individually for, um, for the patients based on something like their genome. So big fields for that are um, cancer genomics, uh, as well as in pharmacogenomics, or the managing of drug dosing based on your genome. So um, there are, just to set the stage just a little bit, there's around 8,000 genetic diseases that are known. Um, they're affecting one U.S. child in 30, and so what that means is in this picture, you can assume that maybe at least one kid in that class um, might have some kind of genetic disease. And this has a big impact on healthcare, so one in six um, children's hospital admissions are due to genetic disease. And then in the Kansas City area, um, it's the cause of one in five deaths for the 60,000 babies that are born in Kansas City. And so the hard fact is that we know the genetic cause of around just under 5,000 of these. Um, however, diagnosis is not straightforward at all um, and often takes years. And without a diagnosis, of course, it's hard to know how to treat a patient. Um, leading to what gets called the diagnostic odyssey. Um, you have a patient who ends up going through years and years and years of doctor's visits and expensive tests without, um, without ever getting a diagnosis, maybe. Um, and so this is right where we're aiming our center at. So a very powerful tool that's come up in the last, gosh, it's now 10 years. Whew, 10 years. Um, so the sequencing world really changed in 2005, 2006, um, with the advent of this thing called next generation sequencing. And what that describes is a class of sequencers that were um, able to produce data faster and cheaper than ever before. Um, so if you say next generation, that implies that there was a first generation, and um, that's what we would call Sanger sequencing, um, that was known to be very, um, very accurate, very high fidelity. Um, but fairly low throughput. That's the technology that the original Human Genome Project was, was done with. Um, next generation sequencing, um, by contrast, is what you'd call massively parallel, meaning that a single instrument is uh, simultaneously producing billions of short little 
uh, DNA reads that are maybe 100, 150 base pairs in length. And it has relatively high error rates. And by that, I mean maybe one base in around 1,000 that are sequenced might be, um, might be a sequencing error. So this is a required slide to show in any genomics talk for the last 10 years in which it shows the cost of DNA sequencing plotted against Moore's law. Um, so if we remember that um, the original human genome reference sequence took around uh, 13 years, cost about $3 billion, um, 300 million of that was for the sequencing alone. Um, by comparison, uh, just down the street at Children's Mercy, we just got an Illumina HiSeq 4000. Uh, this produces 1.5 trillion base pairs of data in a three-day run. That's the equivalent of 16 human genomes in a three-day run, and it's about, you know, $1,500, $1,600. Um, so the impact of that means that we go from a world where we had a single representative genome to we're really able to look at individuals um, and, and make use of individual genomic information. What that's brought with it is what gets called the data deluge. Um, and that means that informaticians like all of us are um, seen as a really crucial piece of this puzzle because it's impossible to make sense of all the information without very powerful comp computational tools. Um, the data are very large, um, and the, the costs right now of infrastructure for doing genome sequencing are fairly high. It requires compute clusters and uh, high-performance disk and things like that. So just to review, uh, the human genome, 6.4 billion letters, A, C, T, and G, organized in pairs. Um, that's a, the equivalent of typing. If you were to sit down and start typing 60 words a minute for eight hours a day, you'd be doing that for 50 years to come up with a single genome. Um, nowadays, the accepted number of genes is around 19,000 protein coding genes. That's 2% of the genome. And together, they, um, with some alternative splicing, code for around 100,000 different proteins. So when we're talking about um, doing genomic analysis with next-gen sequencing, what we really mean is, is something called variant detection. And what that means is we compare a patient's sequence against the human reference genome, and we identify all the spots that it differs from the reference genome, and we call those spots variants. Um, so our Illumina HiSeq, again, producing us 16 genomes. Um, the data is producing 10 billion, 150 base pair reads. Um, the first step we need to do is find where those little pieces belong in the genome, uh, and that's a step called sequence alignment or mapping. Uh, line them up against the reference genome and then compare. Uh, when we do the sequencing, we end up measuring each site in the genome around 30 or 40 times. So we'll have 30 or 40 uh, of those reads, each going over a single position. And then what we end up doing is software looks at the data and does a consensus call at each position. So in our, my example here, I've got, I've got a little spot there where you can see 12 reads are actually calling a C, three reads are calling a G, maybe that's some kind of error. The reference, however, is an A, so we might call that a pretty strong call. Um, this is what a variant call would look like. On chromosome one, at position 129,990, we've got a shift from an A to a C. And then the last step, once we've identified the variant, is try to figure out what that means. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I'll go back quickly. If anybody's interested, this alignment step, there's a number of different tools that are out there. I've listed some of the common ones. Uh, in our center, up until very recently, we used a tool called GSNAP, which was produced by this uh, wicked smart guy, Tom Wu, out of Genentech. Um, and we've recently switched to BWA, mostly for performance reasons. So that step of mapping reads to the genome is um, a non-trivial computational task. And uh, people, some very smart people have spent a lot of time doing, uh, looking into ways of doing that as efficiently and quickly as possible. So the basic problems are, one, that this, the data that we're talking about, again, are very large. The reference genome, it's you know, organized as a 3.2 3 billion base text file, you might think of. Um, and then we'll get you know, as many as a billion reads for a single human's sequence. We need to map all of those. Um, it's also difficult because sequence alignment is not just doing an exact match of, of string matching. Um, you need to account for uh, mismatches between the read and the reference. Some of those might be errors. Some of those might be just normal variation. That's, you know, some of this variation is what, you know, that's what makes us different individuals. Um, and so you would expect that there's going to be some difference between your reads. Um, that might be simple substitutions where you have, say, a C for a T, 
or it might be an insertion of a number of bases or a deletion of a number of bases. Um, the last problem is um, that given the, the genome's filled with pockets of what we call low complexity sequence, where you might have something like 1,000 A's straight in, the, in a row. And if you have 150 A's, it's hard to know where that's going to be, where's, where's the right place. So repeat regions, low complexity regions, mean that these little short reads might map to multiple places in the genome. So from an IT perspective, there's some challenges also. So um, a while ago, I put together some stats on what um, the disk cost was for a single whole genome sequence. And there's a lot of transient data that the sequencing instrument produces that um, we, we now throw away. And back in the dark ages of next-gen sequencing, we actually used to, to save all that stuff um, because it seemed like good science to do. Um, <laughs> But uh, it just became quickly, it was completely unrealistic to do. Uh, and so we settled for what's called maybe, you know, the results of the primary analysis, which is just the sequence itself. Um, but still, that adds up. If you take the raw sequence and the alignment file and then a variant file and then an annotated variant file, we end up with about 170 gig gigs of data that we really need to save permanently for each patient. Um, so in our center right now, given the instruments we've got, we're theoretically capable of doing 64 genomes every six days. That means that we're accumulating a load of around 11 terabytes um, of new data every week. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, the Children's Hospital, it's a pretty big hospital. We have 6,500 employees. Um, I think it's around 350 beds. But my little data center uh, has more data than the rest of the hospital combined because of this. So we've got some big computers also to handle this. So we're, we're primarily a Linux world. Um, we've got a Linux compute cluster that's um, around 1,200 cores currently, six terabytes of shared RAM. Um, we're using SGE uh, or OGE now to um, you know, manage most of the job submissions. Uh, in addition to the primary cluster, we've got you know, a number of utility servers. And we're pretty open source. We've got a MySQL database. That's, that's our workhorse. It's working just fine. We've got some MongoDB and web servers running combinations of Ruby on Rails, Django, I guess some Spring. Um, our disk storage, as I mentioned, is um, it's a big concern. It's probably the biggest thing I spend money on every year is keeping up with disk. Um, so we right now have two different tier one storage systems. We've got um, an Isilon system that's just under a petabyte of usable disk. Uh, and then we've got a new data direct uh, network, DDN. Um, about 400 terabytes coming online, actually maybe even right now as I'm talking. Um, we're looking to expand probably to up to two petabytes over the next year. Um, so the, the kinds of jobs that we run are um, varied quite a bit. And so our, our cluster overall is optimized for flexibility rather than pure speed um, because we need to accommodate large memory jobs versus other kinds of jobs that are high I.O. And then um, we've got a Hadoop cluster running uh, and managed by um, Sudden Grid Engine. And of course, we need to back up everything. Um, so we, number one, we, for our clinical, um, our clinical patients, um, we've made the commitment that we'll store data forever. Um, for our research patients, we go a year back. And of course, we need to have disaster recovery. And so we've got a, um, this nice system, SGI SpectraLogic uh, system that's handling everything. What it is is basically tape in the back end, on the back end, but it's got a software front end that sort of just appears like a normal disk drive. Okay, so uh, in our center we do three different types of sequencing mainly. So the first is tag scan. That's um, an optimized panel. It's uh, about around 570 genes. Um, these are all disease, uh, genes that are known to be involved in inherited disease. Um, We've got whole exome sequencing, which is just the protein coding parts of the genome, and then we have whole genome sequencing. And so a tag scan test will give us about 8,000 variants, an exome will give us around 200,000 variants, and a whole genome is more like around 4 million. So we have this piece of soft, these three pieces of software I call the Nordic Suite, Saga, Runes, and Viking. They're aimed at taking the, um, yeah, these are all classic backronyms too. You know, I had to come up with a clever name and then come up with the acronym that fit it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for that. So um, 
but their whole aim is to take the large list of variants and get down to the few that are, um, that are relevant to the clinician. So the first, uh, Saga, uh, the goal of Saga is to come up with a candidate gene list that's based on the patient's symptoms. So what we do is we take a, if you describe the patient's symptoms in a controlled vocabulary like SNOMED CT or the human uh, phenotype ontology, then we can rely on curated data to, um, given, to come up with a, a list of genes that we think might be relevant to the patient's systems, um, symptoms. Excuse me. So just an example, if we take from the sort of plain English uh, of the medical record uh, and then turn it into these controlled vocabulary terms, if we enter ataxia, 79 genes, startle response will give us four, muscle weakness will give us 109, and then there's the hex A gene that's shared by all of them. So then the second piece of the puzzle is called runes. Uh, runes is aimed at answering the question, what does a single variant call mean? Uh, because when we get just a positional change, there's really no functional information about that. So we end up characterizing variants um, using prediction tools and cross-referencing with external databases to try to find out what it means. So variants go in, they get, what gets spit out is lots of annotations about on the variant. What gene is it in? Does it change the protein that's coded? Uh, is it known to be disease-causing? Is it known to be benign? What's its allele frequency in the population? Uh, and then finally, the software assigns a score where uh, you know, one to five, where one is basically a known, known disease-causing mutation and a five is it's known to be benign. Um, we've loaded up every single variant, the results of every variant that we've ever seen in our center into a database called the Variant Warehouse. Um, all of the runes annotations for each variant are stored in there. Uh, we've got 129 million variants as of Friday um, from around 4,100 patients. And uh, we have a lightweight web application on the front of it that lets you search by some of this, uh, you know, gene by category or by frequency. And we've got some curation tools to capture output as people are looking at these things. The allele frequency, so that's counting how common it is in our population. Um, and so we've done that with a Hadoop MapReduce job. And um, it, if you look at it, it's really incredibly similar to the word count example that every single MapReduce tutorial in the world shows you. Because what we do is we go through a variant file and we just emit, uh, I saw this variant with this sample, and then the reduce function just tallies that up. And there's a couple of other things that are going on, but that's, that's the bottom line. Um, so Hadoop's really a perfect fit for this. And it's so fast that we just do it five times a day. Um, looking at the variant warehouse, um, you can't see very clearly, but the bottom line here is that when we compare to external databases, more than half of the variants that we've seen are, are novel. They've never been seen before. And so the bottom line is that we're just at the beginning of this whole thing. We've got a long way to go um, before this is a, routine, a completely routine thing and be before variant interpretation is completely routine. Last step, Viking, um, a Java Swing app that um, integrates Saga and Runes to let uh, medical geneticists actually look at results. And so the way it works is um, Viking shows a list of variants, lets you filter by some common things. You can enter in the symptoms right here. It'll pull up the affected diseases and genes. You can put a filter on it like show me things that are very rare, the idea being that disease-causing mutations are likely to be very rare in the population. And um, in this, this example, we go down to a single causative variance. We've gone from as many as five million data points down to one, just literally in a few seconds. Okay, so I've described our toolkit. Let me just try to quickly run through what we can do with this stuff. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just run through a few patient cases and show you how we ended up using this. So the first is genomic medicine can end the diagnostic odyssey. So these were our very first two patients in our center, CMH01 and 02. Um, they were a pair of sisters who had ataxia, meaning loss of motor control. Um, and by the time they reached us, they'd been five years with, with testing, uh, $23,000 of tests with no answer. Um, we ended up doing exome sequencing on them and found that they had what's called a compound heterozygous mutation of the APTX gene. Um, what that means is their mom and dad were each carriers of one genetic change. They were carriers that were not symptomatic. Both daughters were um, inherited that from each of their parents, and so they were homozygous for a change uh, that um, basically uh, went from a normal amino, changed the amino acid that was coded to a stop codon, meaning the protein was not fully produced. 
Um, but knowing now that this is the gene that's affected, we're able to suggest a treatment change. Turned out there's a very low-cost supplement that we're, dietary supplement that we were able to get them, and sure enough, they started improving. So there's some powerful treatment options that we can do once we make a diagnosis. So in this case, we had a 20-month-year-old boy he had very severe anemia. By the time he was around two years old, he was getting transfusion, blood transfusions almost constantly. Um, he'd had a $30,000 workup without a diagnosis. Um, we were, enrolled him in XM sequencing. I'm not going to try to actually say what he was <laughs> diagnosed with. Um, but we, once having that name to pin on it, we were able to search literature and find that there was another patient who had been treated with a bone marrow transplant uh, and that he was cured. And so he went in for a transplant in June 2012. He did have some infection problems due to the, um, to the transplant, but he got over that and now he's at home and he's, he's cured. So we can discover new phenotypes. And what that means is that Patients don't always read the medical journals to know how they should present when they have a disease. <laughs> so in this case, we had a 10-year-old boy. Um, this is, he'd been in our clinic for around eight years. Um, around six, he started um, having seizures a lot. And by the time he was 10, he was seizing almost, almost constantly. Um, when we sequenced him, we found a mutation in the PIGA gene. Um, that was diagnostic. But the thing was is that patients who were known to have that gene mutation are almost always, they almost always die within the first year of life. In other words, this patient presented very unusually and would have never, without actually looking at what's in his genes, it's very unlikely the clinician would have ever picked that as being his condition. And we can identify genes for which there are simply just no other tests. Um, and we do that basically by looking at, at all of them. Uh, so here's another patient. She's a six-year-old. She's got very severe autism. Um, when we looked, we found she had a, what's called a de novo mutation, meaning it spontaneously arose in her genome. So her, neither her parents had it. She has a two-letter uh, deletion in the ASXL3 gene. Uh, and this is, not a, this is a gene for which there's no test. The standard um, genetic testing, it's not even on the panel yet. Uh, right after we had found this, it actually one other patient had been published on out of Germany. Uh, and, you know, there's just a very small number of people that are ever going to have this. Okay, and so without um, too much hyperbole, I think we can say that genomic medicine can create a paradigm shift. So as an example, I want to talk to you about a seven-year-old boy who came in with progressive muscle weakness. You can see he's kind of lying there, floppy on the examination table. Um, his parents had brought him in, uh, and the clinician noticed that his two brothers were sitting there, kind of slumped over in their chairs also, and asked the parents about it. And they said, well, yeah, actually, they're, they seem to have some of the same, same thing going on. Um, so we put him into exome sequencing, found a change in the nebulin gene, um, came up with the diagnosis. Having the diagnosis from the patient means we can go do a really simple uh, confirmatory test in his affected siblings and the unaffected siblings to confirm that that's really what's going on. Um, that also suggested that he ought to have a cardiology eval um, because there was a risk of some heart problems that, we, that are implied by um, that gene change. But most importantly to the happy mom, this is a biopsy-free result. So we're able to diagnose the kid by taking, you know, blood or cheek swab without doing a painful biopsy. That's a big plus. So the paradigm shift is that if you look at our first two cases, they'd had $35,000 of testing. They'd had 35 different specialty clinic visits over many years. And that last case, that was his first visit. First visit to our clinic, $3,000 of test, and he's got the diagnosis. OK, and finally, we can rapidly diagnose critically ill patients. And so this is something that our center actually got a fair amount of attention for a couple years ago. Um, we published something called StatSeq, which is, uh, at the time, it was the fastest genome sequencing in the world. Um, we described how we could use a 50-hour uh, protocol to do the sequencing and the analysis, and the target population was babies in the neonatal ICU. So these are kids who are less than a, a month old who are critically ill. And that managed to get us on the front page of the New York Times right below Mitt Romney. Um, <laughs> The point being that kids in the NICU are, are incurring something like $13,000 a day of charges. And so even a fairly expensive test like a whole genome test in that context becomes seen as really worth it if we can affect their, um, if we can affect their, their care. 
Um, yeah, it was also named one of Time's uh, top 10 medical breakthroughs of 2012. Um, so what it, just a quick overview. Um, first, we, if we identify the patient and get consent in the DNA sample, then we go into the pipeline. So 30 hours of sequencing, 15 hours on the whole compute cluster to do that sequence alignment step, um, variant detection around three hours, characterization an hour and a half, and then a half hour for a human to actually look at the results. That gets us our 50 hours. Um, we just published a paper where we improved this down to 26 hours, and one of the main things was in that sequence alignment step. There's a commercial company called Etico Genomics that produced, um, produced a, a, a single compute box that can do what used to take the whole cluster, uh, you know, 15 hours to do. Now they can do that alignment and variant detection step in an hour, which is pretty impressive. So, I mean, this is the kind of things that are starting to happen that are going to really enable us to scale this big. Oh, you know, we can't, not every hospital is going to be able to own a cluster like the kind Children's Mercy has. Um, but if you look at a, you know, more modest single box, that all of a sudden makes it much more possible. So an example of this, we had this patient um, in, you, in um, before the baby was born, uh, had an MRI that showed that looks like there was a few different things going on, congenital anomalies. And so the baby was delivered in CMH's maternal fetal health center and then immediately admitted to the NICU. And by the time uh, he was two months old, he had acute liver failure. Um, there was really no cause that we could identify despite the intensive testing. Um, so we sequenced this whole genome. And so remembering that we start at, you know, 3.2 billion base pairs, um, of which we found 5 million variants, differences to the reference. Of those, if we looked at just the rare ones, less than 1%, there was 2 million. If we looked at ones that are maybe expected to change the protein that the gene produced, we're down to 1,500. And then if we take his um, symptoms into account, we're all of a sudden down to 2, which leads us to a diagnosis of something called HLH2. This, is allowed, this allowed him to be uh, have a change in treatment. We gave him some steroids and immunoglobulin. The bottom line is his liver function is returned to normal in the baby's home. So if we step back and look at StatSeq, um, this is actually, I have to admit, this slide is a little out of date um, because we've done more families since this. But of the first 39 that we did, um, usually what we try to do is to sequence the baby and mom and dad to help the analysis. Um, we had a diagnosis in about 60% of them. Um, of the ones that we diagnosed, 70% had what are called de novo variants, meaning they weren't inherited. They were basically spontaneous mutation. And that was really surprising. That went against a lot of what was the conventional wisdom of how these diseases are being passed down. Um, we not identified four different candidate disease genes uh, over the course of doing these 39. So now that we're able to look at all the genes, uh, new disease gene uh, identifications are coming every month. I've got a, a cron job that runs that goes to a public database every month to get the latest. And every month it's probably about five or six are added. So bottom line, if we were to step back and say, is this worth doing? I, I think the stats on our StatSeek are saying yes. Okay, so I think I'm just about out of time. Um, I just want to give a little plug to say that all the software that I just described, we're in the process of making freely available um, for academic research use. Um, we're unfortunately not able to fully open source it, uh, but we are going to be able to release uh, binary installations. The Saga website will be made publicly available. Um, Runes and Viking, you'll be able to download and run it. Um, and this, again, will be for no cost. We've been actually exploring doing a software as a service for Viking uh, because even the software is only a piece of it. The hardware to run it is another. Uh, so the idea would be that we can enable small labs that don't have compute resources or, or a bioinformatics team. Um, we can still use our software. Uh, and finally, our variant warehouse website is going to be made publicly available. Um, we're going to be providing our data and bulk downloads by FTP and then implementing what's called a beacon service where we'll have a little web service that lets people just query and say, have you seen this, this variant? So with that, hopefully I've given you a good overview about what we're doing and how, um, you know, how us as technicians and technical people are actually able to make a difference. It was, it was a nice surprise for me to find that out. Um, and with that, I'll finish up and thank the whole team at Children's Mercy, and thank you for having me.